definition of true worship is taking place in the church. It's a restoration of worship that attracts the manifest presence of God. There is the presence of God. We all know about the presence of God. We have sensed the presence of God. But the manifest presence of God is what brings results, is what brings miracles, is what changes things. And the, re the reality or the truth of it is that when we come together as a body, even in our, in our uh, even personally, but more so when we come together, there are certain things God wants to accomplish. And worship is key to God doing what he wants to do. Sometimes if worship is not flowing as it's supposed to be, the Spirit of God cannot accomplish the will of God for us in a particular service. I really mean that with all of my heart. And God is bringing the understanding of what worship, true worship is all about because God is still seeking for those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Throughout the ages, worship has gone through um, many changes. I've known the times when what we do was called a song service. And today, people still refer to it as a song service because many people still see what you're doing as singing a song. But it's much more than that. We're not merely singing songs. Some people call it, I've, I've, I've been to churches, grown, grown up in churches where you heard after the song service, I say that deliberately, now we'll change the order of the service. And those are, those are just religious terms. Sometimes they sing songs there, they clap their hands and beat the tambourines and play the drums and all of that. And they say we change the order of the service. And, uh, and then others will say, uh, and now the preliminaries are over. Now we come to the most important part of the service, the Word of God. But God has helped us to realize that everything we do from start to finish is important. It's important to God because from the time we begin to the time we end, it's worship. Giving even our, our, our offerings, that's worship. I mean, listening to the Word is worship because we're not supposed to just listen passively to the word of God. There should be something active going on where the, the, the person who's ministering the word speaks, but the Holy Spirit is speaking to us and even revealing more to us. So there's an exchange going on. That's worship, an exchange between us and God. So down through the ages, in order for men to worship, in the Old Testament, you see in Genesis, in order for man to worship, he will build an altar. And he will dedicate the altar unto God and that's where he connected with God. And that was worship. After the flood, Noah built an altar and called upon God. And God saw it, received the worship, and then made a promise, I will no longer destroy the earth with a flood. And somehow, Adam and Eve knew what it was to worship. They didn't very much need the altar because they had God himself. But I believe they passed on the, the truth of worship to their children. And we see in Genesis chapter 4, verse 3, to five, where Cain and Abel came to worship, and they understood that worship involves giving to God. You cannot worship and not give to God. Worship is giving. Worship is sacrifice. The one in the New Testament, it talks about bringing uh, and not offering the sacrifice of praise unto him. It is sacrifice. Worship is giving. And the Bible said that Cain... You can read the scripture yourself, Genesis 4, 3, and 3 to 5. Cain worked the ground. 
Abel raised flock. The Bible said in the process of time, Cain brought some of the fruit. You can understand the Hebrew, um, uh, Hebrews, Hebrew term, some of the fruit, and offered to God in worship. And, and Abel also came to worship, and he brought the, the best of his, of his flock. The best, the purest, and offered to God. And the Bible said God had respect on Abel's worship, but to Cain's, he had disrespect. He didn't receive Cain's worship. The Bible talks about Abraham. He built an altar and called upon the name of the Lord there. Genesis chapter 12 and verse 8. Whenever God revealed himself to people, they built an altar and worshipped. And under the law of Moses, God regulated how worship was to be done. God established, first of all, the tent of meetings, and then, uh, and subsequent to that, the tabernacle, what we call the tabernacle of Moses, a portable temple. Movable temple. And God established the tabernacle as a place where the people would, would go and worship God and offer sacrifices. So it wasn't so much so wherever man went and he had a revelation of God, he built an altar. But God used the, ta the tabernacle as the focal point. There was the altar set up. People would come to the priest. They will bring their sacrifice. They will connect with God there and then. And God established how the temple, how the tabernacle was to be built. It was the outer court where the priests carried out sacrifices and offerings. There was a holy place where priests carried out certain functions. Only the priests can go. And then there was the Holy of Holies, or the most holy place, where only the high priest could go once a year, and not without blood, to offer to God for the sins of the people, the sins that the people committed in error, or in or sins they committed in what we call ignorance. Within that room, it was the golden censer, the Ark of the Covenant was the golden pot that had manna. And there were so many different things. The Ten Commandments, there was the Ark of the Covenant. All of these things were in the Ark of the Covenant. Covenant. And above it, the cherubim. Call it the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat. And one man, the high priest, will go in there once a year to worship and he couldn't he was not supposed to say a word everything had to be done in silence so he'll go about his duty and the only thing that would be heard were one or two bells on the on the hem of his garment that the old outside the priest outside would know that he's carrying about his duties sprinkling the blood on the mercy seat and a rope attached to him. Just in case God did not receive his worship, he would be struck dead. And no one but the high priest could go in, so the rope was to pull him out. But it was worship in silence. But the book of Hebrews tells us that the tabernacle was a shadow of the true one in heaven. It was not the real thing. The tabernacle teaches us certain things. But the tabernacle is, is not just meant for us to focus on because it was a shadow. It was a shadow of the true tabernacle in heaven. And if you understand the true tabernacle in heaven, it has only one room. It does not just have the outer court, the holy place, and the holy of holies. The true tabernacle in heaven has one room, the holy of holies, where the throne of God is. Hebrews chapter 9 
in verse 24. It says, For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with hands. That was, a, that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven himself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 9, uh, verse 6 to 10. Is this very interesting? Hebrews 9, and from verse 6 through to verse 10, gives us a bit about this tabernacle. It says, when everything had been arranged like this, I'm reading from the NIV. When everything had been arranged like this, the priests entered regularly into the outer room to carry out their ministry. But only the high priest entered the inner room, and that only once a year and never without blood. He could not go in the Holy of Holies. They had to be particular. They had to be very strict in how he do it. He couldn't go in the Holy of Holies and say, Oops, I forgot the blood outside. He would not make it by outside because if he stepped in the Holy of Holies without blood, he'd be struck dead. The blood protected him. God answered the blood. God respected the blood. God protected him because of the blood. So it couldn't be, oops. He couldn't come in as he wanted to. He had to be dressed a particular way. He couldn't do as he liked. The bowl that carried the blood had to be a certain size. Had to have a, certain, have a certain amount of blood. He had to wear particular colors in his robe that God respected. And he could not go in when he felt like he had to go in once a year. And he could not go in without blood. Which he offered for himself and the sins of the, that the people committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place not the one on earth, the one in heaven. Get what I'm saying? That the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed. It didn't say not had been discovered. It was not disclosed. So the Bible is saying there was a way into the most holy place in heaven. But through this act, God was signifying that the, the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still functioning. This is an illustration for the present time, indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. They were only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings, external regulations, applying until the time of the new order. I announce that we are in the new order. And we don't have to do that in order to please God, the stuff that the priest did. However, let me put in here, before I go any further, there's still a way to worship God that's acceptable to him. There's still a way we need to present ourselves to God that's acceptable to him. God isn't our buddy. We need to come before him with, with a reverential fear, understanding that he's God and he's a consuming fire. But after the tabernacle of Moses and the ceremonies that went on, a different style of worship was introduced during the reign of King David that totally, that was totally different from the altars that men built, from the tabernacle, from the tent of meetings. It was completely different. We call it the tabernacle of David. In 2 Samuel chapter 6 and verse 6, chapter 6, Verse 16 to 18, it says, As the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, and I explain what the city of David is Zion. 
David captured Zion and he, 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 he made it his city. His, his palace was there. As the ark was entering the city of David, let me pause and explain. The ark under Saul was in Jerusalem. The ark represented the presence of God. That's what was in the, in the Holy of Holies. It represented the glory of God, the presence of God, the provision of God, the covenant of God. That's why in the ark, there was the, the, the Ten Commandments, which represented covenant. There was Aaron's rod uh, that continued to bud. Uh, there was showbread, which represented provision. So the, the ark represented the glory of God, the presence of God, the covenant we have with God. It represented so much, and, the, and Israel knew what the ark meant. Under Saul, it was captured by the Philistines. I wanna, don't want to go into all the details. God struck them because they had no right with it, with pestilences. They brought it back into the borders of Israel and left it there. When David became king over all of Israel, he decided to go get the ark and bring it back to, and bring it back to Jerusalem where it really belongs. But he did something different. Let's read on. As the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michal, or, or some people call it Michal, but Michal, daughter of Saul, the wife of David, watched from a window. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord. Now, they say the ark was coming, but David was dancing before the Lord because Israel understood that the ark represented the Lord, so the ark was God. So if anybody touched that, they died. Anybody was not specified or designated to, to touch it. So he saw, she saw him dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. Why? Because up to that time, there was silence before that ark. There was such a fear of the ark that whenever there is ministry or offering up worship to God, it will be done in silence. But here's David breaking the rules. And yeah, he didn't die. Because it was something that captured the heart of God. David started to dance and David started to leap. Just remember, sometimes when you say somebody's breaking the rules, they're right in the rules of God. It's just your rules you set. And David was leaping and dancing and his wife, first wife, looked at him and despised him in her heart. And it still happens today, you know. When somebody makes a decision to break out of the norm and break out of religion and break out of all the ceremonies that we set and call worship and they begin to break the mold and begin to rejoice in God, somebody going to despise them. A lot of you have been despised. But keep on worshiping. Keep on celebrating. David did, he got the musicians, and what was not to happen around the ark began to happen. She despised them. Let me skip a few verses down, which I don't have. The Bible said, when, she went, when David went home, having placed the ark in the tabernacle, we're getting back to that, she with her sarcasms, how lovely was the king today, huh? He got on like one of the best fellows. They're leaping and dancing. It didn't call for all of that. But see, when you understand what God has done, when you understand where God has brought you from, when you understand where you were in the muck and the mire and where you are today, when you understand it could have been all over for you, but God in his grace and mercy brought you through. When you knew you were at the brink of death and God brought you back. 
when you were sick in your body and they said it will be all over and now you can stand and worship? Let me say something to you. Don't let anyone despise your worship. You went through the test. Now you have a testimony of the goodness of God. Leap, jump, dance, spin around and praise your God because you have a reason A purpose in my heart, let me do a teaching session today, but the thing of worship just at man gets me going. She said, oh, how lovely was the king today. You can imagine her with her stiff upper lip. She got on just like one of the ordinary guys. Disrobing yourself. Not that he was naked. He just took off his kingly garments, recognizing there's only one true king. See, when we come before the presence of God, we got to see ourselves as nothing. Out in the, outside in the secular in the world, we may be this. We may be head of corporation. We may be CEO. We may be manager. We may have three businesses. We may have a name, but when we get in here, there's only one name. That's the name of God, the name of Jesus Christ. And everybody becomes one. He said there's only one king. And he celebrated the king. And she became sarcastic and despised him. And he said, she said, Yo, look how you got it on. And he said, you haven't seen anything yet. If you thought that was best, now the presence of the Lord is back. Watch me behaving. <laughs> but the Bible says something very, very important because the woman did not repent. The Bible said that she bore David no children up until her death. So when we despise something that God embraces, when we despise that which God lives in. Many people remain barren in their Christian life. They bear no fruit. Nothing happens. Nothing is productive. And the language the Hebrew puts it in, it didn't say she remained barren. She bore him no children. And the, the style of the Hebrew is, put it in my terms, she didn't even, he did, they didn't even look at her from that day onward. Not even to touch her. A lot of people, as they despise worship, God passes them by. A lot of people that can be touched by God, He does not touch them because in their heart they're despising what God loves. That's another sermon. Let's read on. They brought the ark. Uh, come back to where it was. Um, chapter 6, verse 17. They brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place. Inside the tent that David had pitched for it. Now, there was the tabernacle of Moses still there. But David decided to pitch a tent for the presence of God. And he had, he did not have the, the outer court, the holy place, and the holy of holies, like the tabernacle of Moses. He had one room, the holy of holies. Just like it is in heaven. We're getting back to that. After the death of David, and uh, commentators say that when David pitched a tent and put the ark in the tent, creating one room, the Holy of Holies, as we're going to read later, he organized worship unto the Lord for the priest to minister to the Lord. That went on for about 40 years. Straight. No break. But after the death of David... God gave orders to Solomon to build a temple. 
and the order of worship reverted to its former way. Outer court, inner court, holy of holies. But there was a difference. The musicians who played in the tabernacle of David were brought into the temple that Solomon built and they were placed in the holy place because they could not go into the holy of holies and they were to make music and minister to the Lord from the holy, holy place. Now as we look into the New Testament, history shows us that in the synagogues, when the, when the Jews met for worship, they sang. It was not a lot of singing, but they sang one or two psalms. But there were no musical instruments. And then even as the church, the early church started, we do not have any, uh, any knowledge from the word of God what obtained among the Jews when the church started in terms of worship. But we get a glimpse into how the, how the Gentiles used to worship. And there's scriptures that support this. But I will deal with this later, maybe next week. One of the forms, or I should say, of all the forms of worship, from Cain and Abel, right away through. We know that as history went on, instruments were added to the church. The first instrument to be added to the church was somewhere around 800 A.D. When the pipe organ was added, and it was a big do. Sin was coming in the church when the pipe organ came in. Centuries later, there was still the organ and the keyboard, the piano, not even the keyboard. I remember, I was a little boy, when the guitar first came, people left church. Because it was a sin. Y'all bringing worldliness in the church. And some blessed old people really got offended because they were bringing banjo in the church. Don't talk about when drums came in. Oh, Lord. Now the beating calypso. And, and, and what I'm saying, there was a, a mindset albeit religious, concerning worship. And, and it was before us in the Bible, staring in our faces, where David got all kinds of instruments and, uh, to worship before the Lord. But because it was, it was a ceremony passed on from one generation to another, people rejected instruments that was really in the mind of God. Devil perverts good things, you know. And we think because it's perverted by the devil, it was not intended by God. Now we have in the church today, in some churches, because some churches only still have the pipe organ. Now we have in the church today, some people have a full band making music unto God. However, of all the forms of worship, starting from Cain and Abel, going through Noah, Abraham, Jacob, Isaac, right through, of all the different forms of worship in the Bible, God prophesied the re-emergence re of one. He said of the tabernacle of, of Moses, it's a shadow of the truth. So it will, do, it will be done away with so that the true one can be revealed. So we know that we're not to worship according to the ceremonies of the tabernacle of Moses because 
it was supposed to fade away. It was to prepare man for the true one. So of all the forms of worship that they were in the word of God, God prophesied the restoration of one form of worship, and that is the tabernacle of David. In Amos chapter 9, verse 11 and 12, God speaking through, through the prophet Amos said, I'm just picking it up from chapter, um, verse 11 of chapter 9. On that day, I will raise up the tabernacle of David that has fallen down. We have it? Good. And will repair its damages. I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as it was in the days of old. Or rebuild it as in the days of old. That they may possess the remnant of Eden. And all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does this thing. God said, I am going to be doing something. And of all the forms of worship, I will raise back up the tabernacle of David. I'm going to repair its ruins or its damages. I will raise up its ruins and I will rebuild it as in the days of old. In the same Amos chapter 9, God was telling Israel that he would scatter them across the nations because of their many sins. And, their many, and they, many times they disobeyed him. In verse 8 and 9, God said, Behold, the eyes of the Lord are on this, on this sinful kingdom. I'm reading it for you. And I will destroy it from the face of the earth. Yet I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, says the Lord. For surely I will command. And I will sift the house of Israel among all nations as grain is sifted in a sieve. Yet not the smallest grain shall fall to the ground. So what God was saying, Israel has sinned. I'm going to punish Israel for its sin, but I'm going to keep make sure that there's a remnant. Then God said, on that day, I will raise up the tabernacle of David. Which day? In the midst of judging Israel, God says, I will restore the tabernacle of David. After I judge them, I will restore the tabernacle of David, which was fallen down, and I will repair its, its damages and raise back up its ruins. Now, this is very, very interesting. While I am doing all of this to Israel, it comes a time I will raise back up the tabernacle of David. Now, I've read many commentators uh, on this, and, and uh, I think almost all of them say God was talking about preserving the, the throne of David so that there will, there will always be a throne for Jesus to sit on. But, but, but if God was talking about a throne, he would say, I will rebuild the throne of David. God was specific. When he said the tabernacle of David. And for any Jew, any rabbi, they will immediately know what the tabernacle of David represented. I'm taking my time to help you along to show you what God is doing in us today. God was speaking of something spiritual and something powerful. But in the New Testament, and when you, when you want to know if something is important, watch it said in the Old Testament and explained in the New. In Acts chapter 15, because James, the brother of Jesus Christ, our Lord, one of the leaders of the early church, 
gives further interpretation and explanation to this verse in the book of Acts, chapter 15 and verse 14 to 17. It was an issue. Gentiles were being saved. Religious people were saying, you have to be circumcised according to the law of Moses in order to be truly saved and pointing the Gentiles back to that which was faded, has faded away. Still happens today. Huh? So the church met to discuss this and James, Jesus' half-brother, receiving revelation from Jesus, said, listen, I'm reading it, verse 14. And after they had become silent, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And with these, and with these, and with this, the words of the prophet agree. Just as it is written, after this, I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. And I will rebuild its ruins, and I will set it up, so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. Even the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does these things. So James put some explanation to this, and he is saying the restoration of the tabernacle of David by God is so that the Gentiles can come into the experience of seeking the face of God. Can come into, and whenever you see seeking the face of God, it has this connotation about worship. So that the Gentiles can come into worship and to worship God just as the Jews did. Now, when God said he was rebuilding the tabernacle of David, he was not talking about a natural tent. He was speaking in spiritual language now. And Jesus, God was talking about the activity, the kind of worship that went on in that Holy of Holies. And that's what we need to explore. What is this tabernacle of David? Do we pitch a tent in the church now? And put an ark and kind of everybody begin. No, 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 no. It's a spiritual thing we're talking about. It is worship, spontaneous and exuberant worship in the presence of God. It seems to me that the only kind of worship that... Ah, Lord, help me. If I put the term wrong, please forgive me. That truly satisfied God was the kind of worship that there was in the tabernacle of David. It seems to me that the only thing that God is after today is the rebuilding of that kind of worship. Now, in 2 Samuel chapter 6, and, and we're doing some reading because I'm doing a teaching session just to help us to see that we all will be... Um, in one accord with what God is saying and doing new dimensions. Second Samuel chapter 6. And I think it is verse 12 to 19. Let me pull that up here. Okay. You got it? Now, King David was told the Lord had blessed the household of Obed-Edom and everything he has because of the ark of God. So David went to bring up the ark of God from the household of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. When those who were carrying the ark of the Lord taken six steps, David sacrificed bull and fattened calf. When a little in ephod, David was dancing before the Lord with all his might. When he and all Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord, while he and all Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sound of trumpets. As the ark of the Lord entered the city of David, 
Michal, daughter of Saul, watched him from the window. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. They brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings before the Lord. After he had finished sacrificing the burnt offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord. And uh, I want to pick up a bit further down. I'll pick back up this verse in uh, First Chronicles in just a moment. So the tabernacle of David is what David established as worship unto God. The Bible tells us that David took the stronghold of Zion he established that as his place. He set worship there. And that was all in the plan of God. Now the tabernacle of David contained only the Ark of the Covenant. Thus it became a tabernacle of the Holy of Holies. According to the law, there was to be no talking in the Holy of Holies. Yet in the tabernacle of David, the scripture shows us that David set out the, the Israelites, the priests, to worship God, to sing, to dance, to rejoice unto the Lord. Now I want to pull another scripture in just a moment. Because it's important what, what David did. In the tabernacle of David... Scripture tells us, and we're going to read some in a moment, that they worshiped God day and the night. They made petitions. They gave thanks unto the Lord. Uh, they blessed his name. They wrote psalms. They sang spontaneous songs. The rebuilding of the tabernacle of David, therefore, is the rebuilding of ministering to God in worship. In the midst of the manifest presence of God. The question is, why was God so pleased with David? Because if you look at the Jewish law, David brought the rules. Why didn't God kill him? Because David tapped into heaven's kind of worship. That pleased the heart of God. And the other question is, why did God say, of all the forms of worship, that he will raise back up the tabernacle of David? It's simply this. It's the style of worship that was experienced in the tabernacle of David was similar to that which is experienced in heaven. Let me read some scriptures. From the book of Revelation, we get a glimpse, only a glimpse, into how worship is done in the presence of God. Revelation chapter 4. I want to read these scriptures quickly. I hope you're jotting them down. You can read them on them when you get home. I want to cover some ground and next week finish off. Revelation chapter 4. And pardon me if I read a bit fast. Reading from verse 6. John describing a scene in heaven. Also in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center, around the throne were four living creatures and they were and they were covered with eyes in front and at the back first living creature looked like a lion the second one was like an ox the third had the face of a man the fourth was like a flying eagle 
Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even with eyes under its wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Day and night, night and day. Can you imagine that? Let's read on. Whenever the living creatures give glory to God, or give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down on, before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and said, You are worthy, O God, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. We begin to see something happening around the throne of God, in the presence of God, that did not happen in the tabernacle of Moses. There was singing. Hey. People casting their crowns before the Lord. Strange actions. People blessing God day and night. Talking about how holy he is. Let me read another scripture. Revelation chapter 5, verse 9 to 12. And they sang a new song. I want to remember what the, the scriptures I just read from Revelation. Because you will see the parallel in the tabernacle of David. They sang a new song saying. In other words, that song was never sung in heaven. It's a spontaneous song unto God. So you get the, the, the thing that people are worshiping him, saying how, how holy he is. They're saying he is worthy. Then there is singing, singing songs that were not sung before. The New Testament says they sang a new song. Today we call it a song of the Lord. Paul in Colossians and Ephesians calls it spiritual song. They sang a new song, and the gist of the song was, you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them a, to be a kingdom of priests, important, to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousand times ten thousands. You worked out that, how much that is? And in your, in your book, neural rebel holes. He couldn't number, so he put it, the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne. So you know, they're real big. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders in a loud voice. They were saying, worthy is the lamb who was slain. Can you imagine all of those angels? You that gotta be loud. Billions of angels. And that has to be loud. And and and, and John noted in a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise and in the language of the Greek is that they were saying it again and again loudly and maybe each time they said it, it was louder that is just a snippet 
a glimpse. I can pull other scriptures from Revelation. How worship is done around the throne in the Holy of Holies. And that's just enough reason to help you to understand why God said, I'm rebuilding the tabernacle of David which was fallen down. I'm going to raise it back up, raise up its ruins so that men will seek the face of the Lord. What is God doing? God is rebuilding in the earth a worship that corresponds with the worship of heaven. God is rebuilding in his church not the worship that resembles that of the tabernacle of Moses where you shut yourself in where everything is be still and know that I am God. It is not, you cannot say a word. It is not the kind of worship where you just sing two songs and a chorus and sit down and change the order of the service. But it's the kind of worship that causes God to respond as man blesses him. That's what God is after. So when people say to us, <laughs> and I've had people, have people say, but this is madness. I've had people come to the church and say, this is crazy. I have two responses for them. I said, first of all, you don't see nothing yet. We just got started. And secondly, I say to them, if you go to heaven, then you're going to want to leave. It's a kind of, kind of worship that obtains in heaven. Where people, where people cast their crowns before the Lord. Where people reach out in worship. Where there's loud singing and the loud worship and the loud speaking unto God. And decorations made and a new song coming forth. You see, the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, and I probably quit here for today because I, I got a lot more to say. But the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, I want you to capture this, that we, the church, can enter the holy of holies in the heavens by the blood of Jesus. I hope you can get what I'm trying to say to you. Now, if we can enter in the realm of the Spirit, the Holy of Holies in the heavens, my body may be down here, but in the realm of the Spirit, I'm there. Then, it stands to reason that God wants us to worship on earth as it is in heaven. Because in heaven, they're in the holy of holies, around the throne of God, worshiping him, and he's receiving it. And on earth, we are joining with heaven, and we are worshiping, and we are dancing, and we are clapping, and we are before the throne, joining the angels. Understand that when a God births a song of the Lord, it's a new song. And sometimes heaven has not yet sung that one. Yes, sir. We rob ourselves of a lot when we start to cry down worship. I don't want anybody coming to me because things are going to get hotter. I don't want anybody coming to me and say, Apostle, it don't call for all of that. And I'm going to say to them, Step back and watch me. You mean this? <laughs> I want you to know, you're not going to get to the apostle. Apostle, we need to bring things down. No, God wants to take things up. At the end of the day, worship is not about us. We don't, we don't come in this place to hear our favorite song. What favorite song? You get in worship? No, God's favorite song. We sing to him. We sing for him. We worship him. At the end of the day, it's about God and God alone. 
do not come and say to me, well, we sing this song last week, and we sang it the week before. We're always singing this song. You're not the one that's taking pleasure in this thing. It is God and God alone. And again, as I was told, some, as I said to someone, if you heard a song for three weeks and you're bored, first of all, we're not singing to you. God is not bored. Second of all, day and night, night and day before the throne, they're saying, holy, 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 and God is receiving it. Then if I have to sing a song for five weeks straight, if he gets the glory, then I'm going to sing it because it's not about me. There is one audience, one person. There's only one. When all of us come in here, it's not about the worship team. Let me want to see how good they sing or if Paula's singing well or if Sue holding her own. It's God that's receiving all the praise. He receives the glory. Somebody say amen. amen. All you come out here to stop me, I'm ready to stop you now. I just get it started. I am tired of religious people trying to tell me what God accepts when God already said. Now understand, we want to get in the flesh. We want to worship God in spirit. But the my Bible also tells me, and I'm just pulling this phrase out, therefore glorify God in your body. I cannot worship God and keep this body still. My spirit can't be leaping and I'm like this. No, when my spirit is leaping, I worship God body, soul, and spirit. In the name of Jesus, I release some of y'all. I need to do this. I release you to worship because God is rebuilding the tabernacle of David. In the name of Jesus, I declare an anointing to loose your feet, to begin to dance before the Lord. In the name of Jesus, I declare an anointing to loose your hands, to begin to bless God. In the name of Jesus, I declare an anointing to loose your body, to begin to bless the Lord. Sometimes we are a bit too stiff, but in the presence of God, there's no stiffness. Everybody is releasing themselves to Him. You, you, you think if God had a problem with noise, because somebody has told me already, God in death. He don't need us to shout so loudly. And my response, neither is he hard of hearing. Don't you think if God had an issue with noise that the Bible will speak of they all of these angels in a loud voice immediately John will say and the Lord God who sits upon the throne told them to shut up but it's not there God loves us sometimes to just release ourselves in fact always to release ourselves to him I declare you loose. Woman be loose in Jesus name. Man be loose in Jesus name. I break the stiffness. I break the religion. I break all the stuff that holds you back. And I declare that new dimensions is a people that 
worshiping, that's rejoicing, that's adoring. Amen. All right, the worship team ready to worship. Them. Let's go. We're on our feet. Let's worship. Let's worship.
created to make your praise. 